Let me pass this around. If you would put your name on it. <coughs> I believe we're picking up around line 690. If you're in the um, Fagel's version, if you're using the other one, it is. Somewhere around 685 or so, because um, there's a part that's in the Fagels that is not in the translation in the book for some reason. The leader says, the leader of the chorus, this is in response to Crayon's long speech where he finishes saying, you know, you want proof, go to Delphi yourself. The oracle will tell you, et cetera, et cetera. And the leader says, good advice, my lord, for anyone who wants to avoid disaster. Okay? Those who jump to conclusions may go wrong. Oedipus. When my enemy moves against me quickly, plots in secret, I move quickly to I must. In other words, when time is of the essence, shoot first, ask questions later. It, it's okay to make a mistake, all right? I plot and pay him back, relax my guard a moment, and, you know, I lose my objective. Crayon, what do you want? What do you want, Oedipus? You want me banished? No, I want you dead. Well, at least he's honest. Just to show how ugly a grudge? Oedipus, still stubborn? You, you don't think I'm serious? No, I think you're insane. No, no, quite sane in my behalf. So... Crayon says, I think you're crazy. And Esther says, no, totally rational. In my behalf, that is for my position. Now, that kind of implies, when it comes to dealing with others who I think are out to get me, out against me, yeah, then I'll be insane. Then I'll go bet you know what crazy to protect myself. Crayon, not just as much in mine. You won't be saying on my behalf or on the behalf of someone else. What issue is Crayon subtly raising? It's the idea of justice. Justice is supposed to be what? Two words you could use. Blind. Blind, right? It's supposed to be like this. I can't tell anything about who's guilty, who's innocent. Equal balance. And blind, it's also supposed to be impartial. You're not, being able, you're not supposed to be able to put your thumb on the balance and tip justice in your way. <coughs> Oedipus is suggesting when I'm on the balance, I'm not just going to put my thumb on it, I'm going to step on the whole damn thing. I'm going to do everything I can to tilt justice towards me. If it's you against me, screw justice. All right? And it's Crayon's like, whoa, 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 whoa. Why? Oedipus is the king. The king is supposed to be the arbiter in this society of justice. So, not just as much, you're my mortal enemy. Why would I treat you justly? Oedipus is kind of suggesting. What if you're wholly wrong? What if you are 100% wrong? Look at Oedipus' reply. No matter, I must rule. That's what's important. Even if I'm wrong, I have to be in control. Thank God we've not had a president like that, right? That has said, I don't care what anybody, I don't care what Congress says. I don't care what the Supreme Court says. I'm going to do what I want to do. What power does the Supreme Court actually have to stop the president 
from doing something illegal. What power? None. The Supreme Court cannot enforce its rulings. It has no authority to. Who does the enforcing of those rulings? The executive branch, the president, and everybody under him, okay? Supreme Court can say what you're doing is illegal, what you're doing is wrong, what you're doing is treasonous, but it can't remove the president. That only comes from Congress, okay? So, Oedipus goes, it doesn't matter. <laughs> to make sure I stay in power, that's what matters. Not if you rule unjustly, Crayon says. In other words, the kind of rule you have is very important. Now, I didn't say this to my first class, but I will say it to you. Memorize this line. <laughs> because when we get to Antigone, the shoe's going to be on the other foot. So I'll just leave that there. Oedipus, hear him, Thebes. That is, do you, do you guys hear what he's saying? Crayon, my city too, not yours alone. Because Oedipus said, my city. What does he mean by my city? He doesn't mean my city, the one I'm part of. He means mine. <laughs> it is mine. I can do with it as I wish. Okay? Leader, please, my lords. Why does the leader try to calm the tension? What are they seemingly about to do? War. Civil war. There will be no city left. Okay? And we're told, look, Yocasta's coming. And just in time, in other words, she'll stop him and listen to Yocasta when she comes in. Have you no sense? Poor misguided men, such shouting. Why this public outburst? Aren't you ashamed with the land so sick to stir up private quarrels? She turns to Oedipus. Into the palace, now! What does she sound like? Mom. <laughs> to a young teen, maybe, or adolescent. <clears throat> and Crayon, go home. Boss and her brother around. Bear in mind, Greek society at the time that Sophocles is writing this, in the society that the play presents, which is many years before Sophocles' age, women had no say. <laughs> they had no voice. They had no power. They had no control. Women were property. Period. Okay? I mean, she is the queen. Give her that. But still, most Greek society... Even if the queen speaks to her husband like this, not good. My, my sister, Crayon addresses her. It's Oedipus, your husband. Notice how he kind of throws that in her face. Your husband, he's been on a choice of punishments for me, banishment from the fatherland or death. Has Oedipus ever mentioned banishment for Crayon? No, he's pretty much on the death side. So Crayon's kind of being generous here. Oedipus, precisely. I caught him in the act, Yocasta, plotting about, okay, what act did he catch him in? Literally, what act? None. Did he catch Crayon and Tiresias hiding in a dark alley, conspiring, plotting? Did he have somebody... Taking notes? No, not at all. Crayon, never. And then Crayon issues an oath. Curse me, let me die, and be damned if I've done you any wrong you charge me with. If I'm guilty of what you say I'm guilty of, <coughs> curse me, let me die, and be damned. That's dead in a not pleasant place. Not hell. Greeks didn't have the, the Judeo-Christian conception of hell. Okay? And Eucostas says, oh God, believe it, Oedipus. Why? 
Listen to the oath he swears to heaven. Okay, now, got to put your 21st century mindset out. You got to get rid of it. You have to adopt the kind of mindset that's embedded within the play. You believe the gods are real. You swear by the gods. What have you just done? What have you made the gods part of? Your agreement, your oath, your lie. You swear by, by you swear by the gods and you lie, you will never have peace. The gods are going to get you for it. You swear by the gods and you don't fulfill what you swore, you're screwed. Okay? So she says, do it for me and for all the people. And the chorus starts to chant, you know, believe it, believe it, believe it. Oedipus, what? You want concessions? What does it mean to concede something? It's literally to give it up. You want me to give something up to him? Respect him, the chorus says. He's been no fool in the past. Oedipus, stop. Calm down. Look at the whole history of Crayon from as long as you've known him. When has he ever acted in the way you are suggesting? When has he ever acted foolishly? It's a rhetorical question. He hasn't. And now he's strong with the oath he swears to God. You know what you're asking. He wants the, the respondent to say what it is exactly. Of course, I do. Get out with it. That is, say it. The man's your friend. Your kin, because he's married to your sister. He's under oath. He's sworn to the gods. Here's what I'm asking. Don't cast him out, disgraced, branded with guilt, on the strength of hearsay only. Who's hearsay. Notice the chorus is very tactful. This would not be me. I've never been accused of being tactful. It's Oedipus's hearsay. That is, don't make him guilty simply of what you charge him with. you, you got to have proof, Oedipus. Okay, if that's what you want, you want me then dead or banished from the land. What's Oedipus mean? It's either Crayon or me. Either Crayon is dead or banished from the land, or I'm dead or banished from the land. Never, the Chorus says. Okay? Oedipus, all right, fine, let him go. I'm skipping the Chorus's next, song, next line. Let him go. Even if it does lead to my ruin, my death, or my disgrace, driven from Thebes for life. Dramatic irony. Why? Because of his curse that he proclaimed on the murderer. It's you, not him, I pity. Why? Because if I'm driven from the land, you will suffer the loss of my greatness. <laughs> That's kind of what it is. Crayon, look at you, sullen in yielding, brutal in your rage. You will go too far. It's perfect justice. And then he explains what he means by it's perfect justice. Natures like yours are hardest on themselves. What does he mean by natures like yours? And that's another line, just kind of burning your memory for the next play. <laughs> what did Tiresias call Oedipus? What adjective? Stubborn. Nature's like Oedipus's. Refusing to yield. Okay? Stubborn. Get out! He's going, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm going. You're wrong, you're so wrong. These men, they know I'm right. So he leaves. The chorus, why do you hesitate, lady? Come, come on, Yocasta, calm your husband down. So she says, tell me what's happened first. Because the chorus wants her to take Oedipus inside. 
Get them out of the public eye. Tell me what's happened. Loose, ignorant talk. A sense of injustice. On both sides? That is, they each had loose, ignorant... What does ignorant mean? Without knowledge. Loose, ignorant talk. Did Crayon say anything ignorantly? No. Oedipus? Oh, yeah. <laughs> All the accusations and charges. What they say, it, it doesn't matter. We don't need to repeat it. End the trouble here just where they left it. That is, just leave it alone. Is that going to solve the problem? No, it's not. It's still going to sit there and it's going to fester. So Oedipus says, you see what comes of your good intentions now? And all because you tried to blunt my anger. Who's he speaking to? The chorus. What were the chorus's good intentions? To get Oedipus to concede something? Could have been that. Could have been what else? What did the chorus try to do between Oedipus and Crayon? Or what position did it take? Crayon. Did it? I mean, not just on, on this page, but even going back. It kind of went... Oedipus, Crayon, I'm going to walk right down the middle of that divide. I'm not going to take sides with either one. Why? If I side with Crayon, Oedipus is going to get me. If I side with Oedipus, Crayon's going to get me. Catch 22. Chorus. My king, I've said it once, I'll say it time and again, I'd be insane, senseless, ever to turn my back on you. And remember, the chorus speaks for Thebes. It represents the people of Thebes. You who are beloved land storm-tossed, blah, blah, blah. So now, again, good helmsmen, steer us through the storm. It's in your power, Oedipus, to do what? Calm everything down. Okay? Chorus walks away. Costa, for the love of God, Oedipus, what is it? That is, why are you so upset? Why this rage? You're so unbending. Another word for unbending? Stubborn. I don't know if they were familiar at this point with Aesop's fables. They probably were. Aesop told the fable about the difference between the mighty oak and a reed. And a big wind comes, and the reed does what? The reed blows and lies flat with the wind, and when the wind dies, the reed comes back up. What does a mighty oak do? Bam! And it's dead. And the moral of the fable is, give with the blows. Take the blows that life gives, and then get back up and keep on going. Not Oedipus. He says, I'll tell you. And he looks at the chorus who've wandered off to the side of the stage. They're not totally gone. He says, it's all Crayon's fault. Says, shh, 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 shh. Tell me clearly how'd the quarrel start? Who began the fight? Eddie. Like a mother speaking to a Young boy who comes home with a bloody nose. How did it begin? I'm going to kill him. No. He says I murdered Laius. I am guilty. He who? He's talking about Crayon. Did Crayon ever say those words? No, he did not. So, Oedipus is guilty of an untruth. I'm going to play a lawyer. From one perspective. <laughs> Lawyers love to quibble. Lawyers love to quibble, to split hairs, right? My son would say, no, Dad, it's all about the context of the words, etc." How does he know? Some secret knowledge, you know? Oh, he sent his prophet to do his dirty work. Notice, his prophet. 
like Tiresias speaks the voice of crayon. So who actually said it? Tiresias, not crayon. Yocasta. Notice she doesn't even address crayon. She's like, a prophet? Calm down. Don't worry about it. Let me tell you a story. Here's proof why you don't need to listen to the prophets. An oracle came to Laius one day. I won't say from Apollo himself, but his underlings, his priests. And we've already been told who was the priest who brought the prophecy. Tiresias. Okay? And it declared, so she relates this prophecy, and what does Oedipus do meanwhile? When she's saying this, here's what we know, or here's how we know what Oedipus does. He says, strange, hearing you just now, my mind wandered, my thoughts racing back and forth. What do you mean? Why so anxious, startled? It's the anxious and startled that tells us what Oedipus is doing while she's talking. She's talking, relating this prophecy, and I think Oedipus starts you know, pacing. His hands start to shake a little bit. Maybe his eyes get a little big. And then when he says, strange, hearing you now, my mind wandered, my thoughts racing back and forth. He's hearing her, and his mind wanders. It wanders from where? From where Yocasta is right now to what? Delphi. His thoughts racing back and forth. They race from the present, hearing this prophecy to I've heard this prophecy before, not from the mouth of Yocasta, but directly from the oracle at Delphi. And then they race back forward to now hearing the prophecy again. What's the likelihood of the exact same prophecy being delivered to two different people? About two different people? Mm, yeah. Nil to none. <laughs> so, she says, what's wrong, Oedipus? You look scared. He says, um, you said Laius was cut down at a place where three roads meet, right? Line 790. He was killed by strangers, thieves at a place where three roads meet. But my son, the one the prophecy was about, he was killed before he was three days old. So you see, prophecy, schmophecy, it means nothing. Um, Elias was killed at a place where three roads meet. That was the story. Um, where? Name the three roads. Name the cross where they meet. And she's like, uh, a place called... Focus, that's it. Two branching roads, one from Dahlia, one from Delphi, come together, a crossroads. They come here. So one road's going to Dahlia here, one road's coming to Delphi, then they meet, and then kind of one splits off and goes to Thebes. All right? Um, when? What has begun? The light has just started to shine in his blind mind. Why? I remember meeting the guy where three roads meet and killing him. It's just a little tiny pinprick of light, though. Why? The prophecy. Oedipus is fated to kill his father, sleep with his mother. He ran away from his father and mother. Okay, so he might be the murderer of Laius, but okay, you know, not as bad as the other. So, when, let's see, Harold's no sooner reported Laius dead, oh yeah, then you appeared. It's like, the Herald beat you to the city gates, you know, by a hundred yards. My God, my God. What have you planned to do to me? 
He's not speaking to the Acosta. He's not speaking to the chorus. He's looking up. Apollo, what the hell? What, Oedipus, what haunted? Not yet, not yet. That is, he's not going to blurt it out. This is unlike Oedipus. Usually, if there's a conclusion, he's going to jump to it. Elias, um, how did he look? Describe him. Had he reached his prime? And she goes, you know, swarthy. Why? Because he's Greek. I don't know if you know any Greeks, but generally, they're not pasty white like most Americans, even tan Americans. They've got a kind of a dark, olivey skin. Let's see. Just starting to get gray hair. And his build? Come to think of it, Oedipus, he looked kind of like you. Okay, so two things you never do as a man who receives this kind of prophecy. Never kill a man old enough to be your father, and sure as hell don't kill one who looks like you. <laughs> oh, no, no. I think I've just called down a dreadful curse upon myself. I simply didn't know. What's his excuse? Honest, Your Honor, I didn't know. Ignorance of law is not a defense against the law, okay? But this isn't a court of law. And it's Oedipus being honest. Yes, he didn't know. Your book gives you one definition of tragedy. I don't remember what exactly what it says, but it's in there. Here's another one that I think is actually better, because it's mine. And that definition is, and this applies to Greek tragedy, it applies to Shakespeare, it works all the way up to even modern literary tragedy. A tragedy occurs when the protagonist or tragic hero is forced to make a decision or take an action when he or she does not have enough information to make a wise decision or action. It applies across the board. What information was Oedipus lacking? who his parents were. He thought he knew who his parents were. I'm going to tell my, my upper division courses when I say some stuff to them about papers. Don't make assumptions. Don't base an article, uh, don't base an argument upon an assumption. You have to prove assertions. I've had graduate students years past who would write these 20 or 30 page seminar papers based upon one assumption after another. You know, all women were always treated bad for all of human humanity up until the 21st century. No, not true. There, for one thing, there were actually matriarchal societies. Not every society was quote unquote patriarchal. So that proves that the falsity of the assumption kind of thing. So he's operating at the beginning upon an assumption. Polybus and Mary Pear are my parents. Why? Because that's what they told him. Don't always assume your parents are telling you the truth. Maybe it would be another assumption not to make. So, Locasta, what are you saying? I shudder to look at you. He has some kind of expression Bear in mind, in Greek, Greek times, characters are wearing these big masks. You can't see facial expressions. So he's acting in some way that's making your costa a little nervous. I have a terrible fear the blind seer can see. Notice what he just called him, the blind seer. He doesn't call him the blind fraud. <laughs> the blind co-conspirator. I'll know in a moment. I'll know. What does Oedipus, throughout the play, always show? He has to know the truth. He has to find the truth. Even in a few moments, is going to say, Oedipus, stop. Stop. My suffering is enough. Stop. And he's like, stop now? I can't. I have to know the truth. And we'll talk about what she means by my suffering is enough when we get there. He says one more thing. She goes, what, what? Ask. 
Did he go with a light, up, light or heavy escort? Several men at arms, like a lord, a king. Why is he asking? Because if she gives one answer, he's free. <laughs> Wasn't me. If she gives another answer, mm, I'm screwed. And she says, there were five in the party, a herald among them. Now, I think that five in the party, I misspoke in my previous class. I think the five in the party means five men at arms plus Elias. My first class, I said the five included Elias. So the five men at arms plus Elias. Elias in the wagon, a herald out in front, a driver of the wagon. So that's one, two, that's two of the five, and then three guards, on maybe on either side and one in the rear of the wagon, something like that. Okay? Oedipus, I, I can see it all clear as day. I can see clearly now, he's saying. Who told you? In other words, I need more data. He's close. He can see the outline and the general image of the puzzle. You know, with Oedipus right smack in the middle of it. But he's got to get all the pieces. Because it could be that the image is going to change, depending on what he's told. Uh, a servant, lone survivor, still in the palace? She goes, no, in fact, it's kind of odd. As soon as he arrived and saw you here, he wanted to be shipped off to Nome, Alaska, you know, to farm the fields there. He wanted us far away from, to send him into the hinterlands. Can we bring him back? She goes, sure. Why? Uh, I'm afraid. I'm afraid. I've said too much already. I, I got to see that guy. Okay, he'll come. But tell me what's torturing you. He says, I will. I'll hold nothing back. So, he relates a story. How long have they been married? His oldest children, his sons, have all left the home. They're in their 20s. They've been married at least 20 years. I kind of think Oedipus and Yocasta have been together for probably 25 or 30 years. My wife and I will celebrate our 37th or 38th, 38th anniversary this year. There's pretty much not anything about her childhood that I don't know. She's just now hearing this story. Seems kind of weird, okay? So he tells the story. Father's Polybus, mother was Merope, king and queen of Corinth, there is a party, the drunk said some things, I went to mother and father, they were enraged, they said don't worry about it, as for my parents, I was satisfied, but the words kept gnawing, I went to the oracle, and the oracle said, quote, you are fated to couple with your mother, you will bring a breed of children into the light no man can bear to see, you will kill your father, the one who gave you life. Pretty much the exact same thing your cost and Elias were told. I heard all that and I ran. <laughs> and I'm going to tell you everything. I went to this crossroads and I saw Harold, a couple of horses drawing a wagon, a man mounted on the back, just as you've described him. That is my build. Hair graying at the temples, swarthy. The driver tried to shoulder me aside. I struck him in anger. The old man watched. He tried to strike me as my back was kind of turned from striking the driver. So I killed him. Okay. Let's go back for a moment. Oedipus says how many were with him 
And she says there were five in the party. And how many did she say were involved in the attack? Just one? Oedipus goes on. So I killed him. If there's any blood tie between Laius and this stranger, then I'm the murderer of Laius. Notice, it was here that Laius was killed, and it was here that I killed a guy who was one of a party of six. What man more hated by the gods? I am the man, no alien, no citizen, welcome to my 900 and following. Wasn't I born for torment? Look me in the eyes. I am abomination, heart and soul. And the audience is going, buddy, you don't even know the half of it yet. I must be exiled, etc., etc. Okay? And the leader says, um, you fill our hearts with fear, but at least, 9, 925, at least until you question the witness, take hope. You're not sure yet. Don't give in a total despair until you know for sure. Oedipus, you're right. He is my last hope. Why? What can the witness tell him that would totally absolve him? You're not the one who attacked him. You're not the one who attacked? Could be that. What else could it be? We were attacked by a group of men. Unless he's got, you know, some kind of psychological disorder, Oedipus is not a group of men. I mean, he might have multiple personality disorder. But that's not <laughs> several people. Okay? Oedipus, if his story matches yours, I've escaped. What do you mean matches? You said thieves, murderers. I told you precisely what he said. Line 937 or so. He can't retract it now. Why? The whole city heard it. Yeah, but when was that? <laughs> like 30 years ago. How many people are going to remember that? I mean, really. Haul somebody up in front of Congress who's in trouble with Congress or the government, and they'll say, I don't recall. I don't remember. So much for prophecy. Jocasta finishes her speech. She says, line 944, Apollo was explicit. My son was doomed to kill my husband. My son, poor defenseless thing, he never had a chance. They destroyed him first. Why does she say they? Why doesn't she say we? Who's the they? Lias and his henchmen. Again, why doesn't she say, we destroyed him first? And she says, Apollo was explicit. My son was doomed to kill my husband. My son, poor, defenseless thing. They killed my child. That's why she says that. Remember when I talked about the play Agamemnon and his wife? And Agamemnon has to kill his daughter, his wife's daughter, in order for the winds to arise? And she holds a grudge for 10 years. Okay? Jocasta is still not happy about having her son killed. Even though the prophecy said what the son would do if the son was allowed to become an adult. So much for prophecy. Oedipus, true. But that shepherd, he'll be able to provide the final proof. She goes, okay, I'll send for him. And the chorus sings... Destiny guide me, always destiny find me filled with reverent, pure, and worthy. What's meant by that? In Mel Brooks's Young Frankenstein, you have a character in one of the scenes, sing out, destiny, destiny, there's no escaping destiny. Why? Because destiny is exactly what it means. It's fated. It will happen. Nothing you can do to stop that. Okay? Which is totally different than this. Destiny, no word for destiny is fate. Okay? So, the, the chorus goes on. Pride, line 964, three, pride breeds the tyrant, violent pride, gorging, crammed to bursting with all that is overripe and rich with ruin, clawing up to the heights, headlong pride, 
clash, crashes down the abyss. Climbing up the heights means wanting to become godlike. And at some point, the gods go, yeah, and knocks you down. Or as the Old Testament puts it, Proverbs puts it, pride goes before a fall. Okay? But if any man, skipping a few lines, if any man comes striding high and mighty in all he says and does, no fear of justice, no reverence for the temples of the gods, let a rough doom tear him down. Repay his pride, breakneck ruin his pride. What is the chorus doing? What's it doing for the audience? It's preparing. What is the chorus describing there? Oedipus. How so? How does Oedipus show the kind of pride that they're singing about? <coughs> he went to Delphi. He went himself. Okay? He didn't get a priest. He didn't talk to Tiresias. He went himself. And the oracle said, you are fated to do these things. And he ran away. Why? Because he was fearful? Yeah, he was fearful of the oracle. What else, though? What was he attempting to do in running away? Avoid the judgment. Oh, yeah? I'm going to make the god a liar. No, it doesn't happen that way. Attempted to say, I'm more powerful than fate. That's pretty damn arrogant. That's saying, no, I am the, as Walt Whitman put it, master of my destiny, captain of my fate. Okay? So, Yocasta comes in. She's carrying a suppliant's branch. She's going to go out to the altar and pray. I'm going to pray to the God, she says. And she says, it occurred to me I should visit the temple. So I have this branch on. Oedipus is beside himself. What does that mean to be beside yourself? Think of it literally. You're here. You're also here. You're of another phrase to describe it. Of two minds. Meaning you're split inside. Distracted. Crazy. Insane. You got the logical and the irrational. So she says, he's racked with anguish, no longer a man of sense. He won't admit the latest prophecies are hollow as the old. He's at the mercy of every passing voice, if the voice tells of terror. So she says, I've come to give offerings to the gods. And a messenger comes in. Anybody know where Oedipus lives? Right here. And then here's, but here is his queen, his wife and mother of his children. Notice the pause. I think, now, that's a modern translation, obviously, and how it's printed on the page is not what you would have had in the ancient Greek, but if this expresses what's in the ancient Greek, I think Sophocles intended for there to be a pause after, here's his wife and mother of his children. Okay. And the messenger, great news. Who sent you? Corinth. And she's like, Corinth, that's where Oedipus is from. He says, I have good news for you. The people there, they want to make your Oedipus king. Is Apollo still in power? Dead. Wait, what? Dead? Yes, dead. Go get Oedipus. Why? Why does she tell a servant, go get Oedipus, quickly? Prophecy schmophecy again. Oedipus was here. Polybus has died. Uh, unless he has superpowers, he couldn't have killed Polybus while he was here. You prophecies of the gods, where are you now? 
This is the man that Oedipus feared for years? He fled him not to kill him, and now he's dead? Quite by chance? Oedipus comes out, now what? Tell him! Listen to him, see for yourself what all of those awful prophecies of God have come to. Okay? So the messenger says, um, Polybus is dead. Murder? <laughs> Sickness? Notice what he jumps to first. Everybody wants to kill a king, you know. The light tip of a scale can put old bones to rest. He was old. Sickness then. Okay. Oedipus. So, Yocasta, why look to the prophet's hearth, the fires of the future? She's over there lighting the offering. And he's like, what the hell are you doing? Why are you offering giving, offering to the gods? Why scan the birds that scream above our heads? They winged me on to the murder of my father, did they? That was my doom? Look, he's dead. I didn't do it. What does Oedipus assume? Not that Polybus is his actual father, what else? Prophecies are lies. Prophets are liars. The gods don't speak to us. Now, in another set of Agamemnon plays that I mentioned, the gods do not only speak to us, they take physical form so that you get to see and talk with Apollo and Athena and the Furies and all these others. Oedipus apparently never has seen one of the gods. Okay? So, Yocasta says, Told you, don't put any stock in prophecies. And he goes, yeah, but I still can't go back to Corinth. Okay, so I'm not going to kill my father. But the prophecy did still say, you're going to sleep with your mother. Merope's still alive. She goes, stop. Fear? What should a man fear? It's all chance. Chance rules our lives. Okay. Let's assume these are your only two options. Which do you choose? Assuming you could choose. Speaking only for myself here, I'd rather have fate any day than chance. Because, you know, chance means I'm sitting here talking to you and a meteor comes crashing through, you know, Happened to some woman in Australia a couple of years ago. She's sitting in her home and <laughs> meteor hits her. Literally, a meteor hits her. Okay? Random chance, right? At least fate, you know. Uh, it's not my fault. I'm just an automaton. Somebody programmed me. We're all in the matrix. <laughs> I mean, that's fate kind of a thing, right? It's all chance. Not a man on earth can see a day ahead groping through the dark. True or false? That's totally true. We might think we know, we know what's going to happen tomorrow or what we plan to do tomorrow, but we don't know that we're actually going to be able to do that. You might get in your car and your car won't start. Sorry. <laughs> For those who've had car problems. Okay? You know, you might be around some friend and the friend's coughing and sneezing and you get COVID and maybe you're one of the unlucky few that now that die. It could happen. Some crazy student could come up here and kill us all. It could happen. Groping through the dark. Better to live at random best we can. In other words, man, live. Because you don't know when you're going to die. Carpe diem. Seize the day. Or as one Greek poet put it, that Paul then quotes in the New Testament, you know, uh, it, the Spartans used to say, eat, drink, and be merry. Why? Or tomorrow you die. Meaning tomorrow you go off into battle. <laughs> and for the marriage with your mother, many a man before you in his dreams has shared his mother's bed. The Oedipus complex. That's where Freud gets the idea from, right there. The Oedipus complex is 
Every man wants to replace his father in his mother's bed. There's another play by Sophocles called Electra. And from it, he gets the Electra complex. Every woman wants to replace her mother in her father's bed. So we're all just totally screwed up. Okay? But then she ends. Take such things for shadow. Oh, by the way, did Oedipus say anything about having dreams of sleeping with his mother? No, he never said that. It was the God who said that. So he's like, I didn't dream that. I mean, I'm normal. That was me. Take such things, that is, the dream of sharing his mother's bed or the prophecies as shadows. What's the problem with that? Do shadows exist on their own? No, they don't. What must you always have in order for there to be a shadow? Louder? There has to be some kind of light and an object that creates the shadow. This is going to be important when we get to Shakespeare. Because Shakespeare is going to play on this idea in both Midsummer Night's Dream and Hamlet. Every shadow has an objective reality behind it. Something that creates the shadow. So, with the prophecy, it's more than just a dream. <laughs> There's something back in it. And that's what Freud latches on to. Alright? Platonic ideals kind of stuff going on here. So, she says, don't worry about that. Well, she says that now. <laughs> in about two pages, she's going to have a slight change of attitude. And so she says, live, Oedipus, as if there's no tomorrow. Live for today. How many of you have read, it's not taught in high school, so I doubt if you have, Thoreau's Walden Pond. In, Th in Walden Pond, you take a course in American Lit and you read that. In Thoreau's Walden Pond, he tells us why he went to live by the pond. He leaves Concord. Well, he doesn't really leave it. It's only two miles from Concord. He still takes his laundry every day to Ralph Waldo Emerson's wife to do his laundry because he's a lazy SOB. Anyways, he goes out, builds this little cabin by Walden Pond, and he says, I went to live on the, by the pond because he wanted to experience life fully. And he wanted to so that when he was on his deathbed would know that he sucked, literally the words he used, sucked the marrow out of life. Marrow, the rich, juicy blood stuff that's in the bones, right? It's why you crack open bones to get to the marrow. He wanted to die going, ah, oh, I've done it all. That's what she's telling her son. Excuse me. Husband. He says, you know, those are brave words, but mom's still alive. I still don't want to do that. So she says, but your father's dead. If her implication is, if part of the prophecy's wrong, then it can't all be fulfilled. Okay? So they go back and forth, and the messenger's like, whoa, 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 what are you talking about? Well, Paul is Maripay. Well, Polybus and Marabag were nothing to you. He said, that's it? That's what you're worried about? My boy, 1105, it's clear you don't know what you're doing. What are you talking about? He says, Polybus is nothing to you. Polybus and I are equals. He goes, Polybus and you can't be equals because you are nothing. He goes, exactly. <laughs> I am as nothing to you as Polybus was to you. Polybus was not your father. He told me he was. Well, that's because he loved you like a son. Where did he get me from? Me. I gave you to him. And so it's everything that's going on in this one, page 85 in this handout. Uh, where'd you get me from? Mount Kitheron. There's another herdsman. Uh, the messer points out his ankles. Why I bring that back up? That's how you got your name. Oedipus thought he was born club-footed. No, 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 no. Your ankles were nailed together. Okay? Who gave me to you? And he's like, I don't 
remember the mess. I don't remember the herdsman's name, but the guy he worked for, what was his name? Lias. That was it. And Yocasta turns sharply. 8,000 candle watt, you know, light just shines through her mind. And she's like, oh, damn. Okay, we will stop around there, around 1145. I did not get up nearly as far as I needed to. Uh, we'll finish this on Monday. Start Antigone. We're going to go ahead and do it. I'm going to post a quiz for Oedipus, but it won't be due until Wednesday. Okay? Have a good weekend.